Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Sonia Barr, and I'm the Senior Development Officer with Central Asia Institute. And we just so appreciate you um, tuning in to learn more about the state of affairs in Afghanistan over the past year and what Central Asia Institute is doing to address these new circumstances. Also, we are just thrilled to have two accomplished and inspiring Afghan women, Hasina Shurjan and Dunya Staniksai along with our executive director, Alice Thomas, joining us to discuss the situation for girls' education in Afghanistan. So just a quick note about today's virtual conversation logistics. Um, in the webinar setting, all participants will be muted except the panelists um, to ensure we alleviate any background noise. And we are covering a lot today. So if anything um, sparks a question, please type it in the Q&A box and we'll leave plenty of time at the end to answer your questions. Um, with that, thank you again for taking time out of your day today. We're, we're just thrilled to have you here. Um, also, we're so excited to have Central Asia Institute's chairman of our board of directors, Dr. Javed Khan joining us. Dr. Khan is a professor and head of the Aerospace Science Engineering Department at Te Tuskegee University, where he's been on the faculty since 2000. He's been a member of CAI's board of directors since 2020. Dr. Khan has an undergraduate degree in aerospace engineering from the PAF College of Aeronautical Engineering, a master's of science in aeronautical engineering from the US Air Force Institute of Technology, and a PhD in aerospace engineering from Texas A&M University. Dr. Khan's family is well known for their commitment and contributions to education in, in, in excuse me, education in Pakistan. Um, and so personally, professionally, and in his role on our board, Dr. Khan is passionate about identifying and facilitating academic opportunities for youth from underserved and underrepresented communities. Um, Dr. Khan, thank you so much for joining us and um, over to you. My pleasure, thank you very much, Sonia. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Javed Khan, and I have the privilege to serve as the chair of the board of directors of this uh, wonderful organization, uh, the Central Asia Institute. Uh, I welcome uh, you all to this informational webinar, and we're deeply indebted uh, to you all for your generosity that positively impacts the lives of so many young girls. And the fact that these children are living thousands of miles away uh, is a testament to your humanity. Uh, the area of Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Tajikistan where the Central Asia Institute operates is rugged with pristine scenery, majestic mountains, and is a dream destination for any backpacker and a mountaineer. However, uh, since uh, I was born in the Northwestern part of Pakistan, therefore I'm acutely aware of the challenges that are faced by children and especially girls to get a decent education. And therefore your generous donations go a long way uh, in supporting educational projects in these areas. Uh, you will hear more details of the work being done by the Central Asia Institute uh, uh, by the other panelists, uh, Asina and Dunia and our executive director, uh, Alice. But as the chair of uh, the board, I want to personally assure all of you that we are committed to being good stewards of the financial support uh, that you provide. We endeavor to be fully transparent and are always available uh, uh, to answer any questions that you may have and keep you fully aware of the impact of your generous support. Um, I will now ask Alice, our executive director, to continue with the proceedings. Thank you again uh, for supporting the education of girls in such far-flung areas and challenging parts of the world. And I will be available to answer any questions that you may have later on. Thank you. Alice, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I see that I'm listed as Sonia Barr, but I'm Alice Thomas, uh, the executive director. Very nice to meet you all today. Or, and to have so many of you join us, we're really, really grateful 
um, that you took time out of a busy Monday um, to join us for, for what's gonna be a very interesting panel. Next month, August 15th, will mark one year since the US withdrew from Afghanistan and the Taliban came back into power. Over that period, we watched our worst fears come true. Uh, the country has fallen into a humanitarian crisis with 90% of Afghans living in poverty, many families without enough food to eat. The, the economy is in shambles. Uh, international development aid has drastically declined. And despite promises, the Taliban has brutally restricted the rights of women and girls. But we've also seen incredible acts of bravery by those who've been fighting for a different and a better Afghanistan, and no one more so than Afghan women and girls. Today, we're extremely lucky to have two Afghan women with us who will discuss with you the, the, the fight for girls' education in Afghanistan and why there is hope for positive change. Uh, but before we go to Hasina and Dunya, I want to take a few minutes to give you some uh, a brief background on the struggle for education in Afghanistan and an update on the educational programs that CAI is currently supporting there, thanks to the support of so many of you. So um, to start out, I always like to show a map. Um, and if you can see this, uh, this is a map of Afghanistan and some demographics. Uh, one of the things I like to point out on this uh, map is um, just how many people in Afghanistan are so young. 63% of the population in Afghanistan is under the age of 25 and 46% under the age of 15. And to me, that's just evidence of why education is going to be so important to the future of the country. <laughs> One of the most important things to note about what the international community achieved in Afghanistan, in Afghanistan during the past 20 years was progress on education for girls and women. At the time the US invaded in 2001, virtually no girls were enrolled in government schools. At the time of the withdrawal 10 year, 20 years later, an estimated 3.5 million girls were enrolled in school. In those 20 years, literacy rates doubled from 20% to nearly 40%. Yet despite this progress, 40% of children were still not in school. And in some areas um, like the rural and remote areas where CAI has been focusing, there as many as 80% of girls are not, were still not in school. So during those two decades, CII worked to address this by supporting a range of educational programs, from building schools to supporting scholarships, to training teachers, to supporting adult literacy and women's livelihoods. However, when the Taliban took control in August last year, it began a campaign of brutally repressing the rights of women and girls, including restricting girls' access to education. While schools were reopened for children at the primary level, so both boys and girls from, a, from grades one through six were allowed to go back to school, and while the Taliban reopened high schools for boys last spring, the group has still not reopened high school for girls. It's claiming that it's working out the conditions, quote unquote, which girls, under which girls will be able to return to high school. At present, it's estimated that this is affecting more than a million adolescent aged girls. In the face of these challenges, however, CAI and its local partners and the communities with which we've worked for so long have not given up. Instead, we adjusted our approach. This new approach centers around what's called community-based education. Community-based education involves working with our local partners to first identify those communities with the highest numbers of out-of-school children and no access to a nearby government school, working with the community to identify a space to hold classes, which is usually in the home of a teacher or, or maybe in a, in a local building, public building. Um, third, recruiting and training teachers. And lastly, uh, providing books, learning materials, and school supplies. Um, this very, this photograph that you're looking, looking at, which is uh, uh, training for teachers that we were doing 
in uh, that our partners were doing in Badakhshan province. And uh, what I love about this picture is that the, the teachers that were taking the entrance to the test to see if they would be selected for the schools have brought their children um, to, to, to sit with them during the exams. Community-based schools also incorporate an accelerated learning component for older girls. Uh, and this is incredibly important because we, we, we want to make sure that, that girls that to date have missed out on school um, don't miss out altogether. Um, and here is a picture of some of those girls who are currently enrolled in the accelerated learning program. We also wanted to emphasize some of the factors that are key to the success. Um, that we're seeing with community-based schools in Afghanistan. First is the fact that we work through our local partners. Um, and these are organizations like Aid Afghanistan for Education, of which Hasina is the executive director, um, and Shining Star, where Dunya worked. These local organizations have all national staff and they work directly with the communities and the local government authorities in setting up the schools. This is incredibly important for building trust on the ground. The second factor is the fact that the, the community itself plays an important role in establishing a community-based school. Before setting up the school, our partners work closely with parents and village elders, and they establish a, a local council that's kind of like a PTA um, to monitor the schools and also to negotiate with the Taliban when problems arise. Currently, through our local partners, including AAE and Shining Star, CAI is supporting 191 community-based schools across five provinces. Approximately 5,700 children, boys and girls, are enrolled in these schools today, and 60% of those children are girls. Our main goal in 2023 is to expand the number of community-based schools to 250 schools and to increase enrollment to 7,500 children, primarily girls. We're also supporting girls at the high school level. Um, these are girls that have been forced to drop out of school in provinces where um, the Taliban has, has not reopened high schools. And um, we're supporting them with at-home learning programs um, where we bring them their school materials at home um, in the hope that they will not fall behind in their learning um, while um, the Taliban continues this policy of keeping their schools closed. Um, so we hope to, to build and expand on those programs in the future for, for high school level goals as well. So with that, I wanna to turn to the stars of the show, Hasina and Dunya. Hasina Sherjan is the executive director and founder of Aid Afghanistan for Education. And as I said, currently CAI is partnering with AAE. Hasina was born and grew up in Afghanistan, but when the country fell, um, when, the, when the country was invaded by the Soviet Union in 1979, she and her family were forced to flee. Uh, they came to the U.S. where Hasina uh, attended the Harvard Kennedy School, uh, and she also earned an honorary uh, degree in law from Queen's University, Canada. In approximately 1999, Hasina flew to Afghanistan for a short period to establish some cl clandestine schools for girls who at the time were not allowed to go to school at all, and 250 girls were enrolled in these schools. A few years later, when the Taliban fell completely and the U.S. invaded, um, she immediately returned to Afghanistan, where she led AAE for two decades in providing education to marginalized Afghan women and men. Tragically, she had to flee again last year when the Taliban took control because it was no longer safe for her to live there, but she continues to lead AAE from abroad. Our second speaker, Dunya Staniksai, was born in Afghanistan in 1994. And to me, she represents the new generation of educated Afghan women. In 2004, she graduated from Kabul University with a degree in law. Um, after that, she worked for several national and international organizations, including NATO. Um, and we came to know Dunya, luckily, when she went to work for CAI's partner, Shining Star. 
Um, in 2020, she came to the US to pursue her LLM at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and we were lucky to recruit her um, to work at CAI in the US for some time. So welcome to both of you. We're so excited to have you both here today. So thank you. Um, I'd like to start out um, with um, a question for Hasina. Um, so can you tell us what is the education situation like today in Afghanistan and why is community-based education important? Hasina, I think you're still muted. Thank you, Alice. And it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and a great pleasure to have been working with CAI. Um, uh, yes, um, <clears throat> Afghanistan, as you know, I've been uh, through a lot in a constant war for over four decades now. And um, in order to really have peace and prosperity in Afghanistan, we need to educate the population. So as you said, you know, still 40% of the girls are out of school, regardless of the fact that they are even allowed to go to school up to sixth grade. So um, the, the, even the current education system in Afghanistan is a very old road system that uh, mainly focused on memorization. So you don't really learn anything and learning doesn't really happen. It's mainly about memorization and then writing down whatever you have just memorized, which immediately goes out of your mind. So um, even to learn how to learn doesn't happen, um, yeah, which we are um, providing students with the supplemental education right now with the help of CAI um, to um, additional uh, material for them to, for self-learning material basically. And, and it's been helping quite a lot. Um, so to educate, I mean, I, I believe if I'm not wrong, I don't know exactly, it, I don't have the numbers lately, but um, I believe that over 80% of the population are still illiterate. So you cannot have a system that really works in people who can really think for themselves and stand up for their own rights without having education. And education for women, of course, I mean, everybody knows that without educating mothers, um, you cannot have an education, educated population. And with our own experience of the last 20 years, we, we saw it and our own um, students who were who were already mothers, but they were illiterate, and she was working as a cook in one of the schools. Uh, she became a teacher going through AE program of accelerated education, and she became a math teacher in the same school. So one day when I was there, her 11 year old daughter was in the school and she said, um, I, I'm the second student in my classroom now because my mother is educated and she can help me with my homework. And we have many, many, many other examples like this. So it's crucial to educate uh, the girls, of course, and as well as the boys. I, I believe that we really need to focus also on the boys because we don't want the boys to be left out because that can create a very different problem for, for the society. Um, so um, uh, what else do you, did you want me to share with, um, with everyone? Yeah, I mean, we can, we can talk a little bit more about um, what kind of demand are you seeing um, among the communities for education now? Um, well, there is demand everywhere and we, we can never uh, um, underestimate the, the, the demand because um, even in the past, you know, uh, fathers and um, husbands even uh, were encouraging their daughters and their wives to go to school. And I, I think all these years of war, one thing that people really learned was that education is the only way that will get them out of this situation. So they really, everybody wants their children to be educated. Everybody will not find an Afghan that would say, I don't want my children to go to school. 
Um, the only thing is that we need to have school for everyone. So these CBE classes are wonderful to, um, um, to provide education nearby because they cannot walk miles, you know, children cannot walk miles anyway, and, and schools are not close enough for them to go to school. Um, I, I really hope that we will be able to build small buildings for each district and each village so that we can have proper schools instead of having a classroom for them. So that we can have, because even now we have been approached with, we're supporting in fact with learning uh, material, self-learning material uh, to um, hundreds of other Afghans through the program with CAI who were not able to be in the classrooms because we really had limited resources and there was no other option but to help them to study at home and they're still waiting and hoping that we will be able to help them. Yeah, it's really amazing, you know, to think about despite the politics of the government that, you know, I remember seeing a survey that said that 87% of par parents and support education for both girls and boys in Afghanistan. So the demand is there. And as you say, we just need to provide the facilities. Um, let me turn to, to Dunya. So Dunya, as a, as, a, as a woman who grew up over the past 20 years in Afghanistan and had education, um, what does it mean to you? And, and how do you think your life would be different if you had not been educated? Uh, first of all, thank you so much for providing me the opportunity to be here uh, and uh, share my opinion and my experience with you all. Uh, of course, education is the core stone for Afghanistan plan development and economic growth, but accessing education is an uphill battle in Afghanistan. Uh, for me, being a Afghan woman who educated in Afghanistan, it was not an easy path because educational opportunities are limited and difficult to access. And uh, access, and sometimes even it does, doesn't exist at all. So you should, uh, the people should be the one fighting for it to get it. Of course, um, for me, uh, I see myself that I'm educated. Uh, currently, I'm in US. If I were not educated, I wouldn't have the ability to be safe, or I don't know even if I would have been alive or not, because um, after my getting education and working, I have been threatened many times, and due to those threats, uh, I left my country, I came here, and I'm pursuing my education, but if I wasn't educated, that wouldn't have been possible at all at the first place. Yes, uh, Afghanistan Constitution, uh, 2004 Constitution, guarantees the right to education for all citizens. The country legally guarantees nine years of compulsory education, but that is what not in practice. You have to fight for it to get it, especially now if we are talking after um, August 15, 2021, the Taliban ordered the the form uh, that the secondary schools should reopen for for boys, but they didn't mention girls. So girls at the primary level, which is till sixth grade, are allowed to go to to get education, but above than that, they are not for most of the places. So this is a battle that is going on for many years. That has been there for more than four years now where Afghanistan is in war. So I feel that if my, of course, I appreciate the help of my family who were open-minded, who helped me to fight, who provided me the opportunities, but that is not the case for every Afghan woman. I, I remember while I was working with CAI, I went to uh, a remote area where um, I, there was a literacy program for women that see I was uh, helping. And I see that those women were so uh, happy to 
get education, like the, the basic education to read and write. And through that, they could find a few jobs for themselves. And then I was seeing that they were telling me that now we could uh, help uh, our children and encourage my husband or other members that to let our girls to educate. So I see how influential this. It doesn't matter at what level you are. If you are at the primary level, high school, or if you are married woman, education is uh, essential at any age that you are. Yeah. Um, well, um, Hasina, can you um, tell us a little bit more about um, how the community plays a role in community-based education and, and what you've seen um, and, and why these schools are sustainable? Yes, um, we learned through our work in the last 20 years that involving communities is crucial. We simply cannot work in Afghanistan without involving the community. So um, we, the very first thing that we do when before even establishing the CB classes is that we establish a CB council within each um, district and and each village and every every place that even if we if we are opening a classroom we establish a uh, CB council and CB council members are elected by the village people um, so and then they introduce three teachers because if we have one class we just need one teacher so they introduce three teachers and then we interview the teachers and, and then we select the one that's most qualified. Um, and if we open an, a second class in the same village then we establish another, um, another council which is very very important because that's how a program in the past 20 years which was just extremely successful because um, everybody was involved. So they, they take ownership and that's the best way to do it because um, they really, they, they go to school, they visit the classroom, they make sure that everybody's safe, they make sure that everybody gets there and, um, and, and they receive an education. So it's really, really has been a very great experience and, and involving um, the council in, in Kabul and some places where we had educated parents, we were, we involved all of the parents, we had meetings with the parents and all of that, but in rural areas where people are mostly uh, not literate, then um, the, this CB councils work because then they elect uh, uh, literate and educated people from the village. So, um, Great. Yeah. excellent, excellent. So looking at, I wanna leave time for our audience. So I'm gonna ask you both a few more questions and then I wanna take some questions from the audience. Um, uh, so Dunya, looking ahead, what gives you hope for Afghan women and girls? There are many things that gives me hope about um, Afghan women because they're not the, the, the same women that they used to be back in uh, the first uh, ruling of Taliban if we see it back 20 years because they have changed. They have changed a lot. They were silent. They were feared at that time and they were accepting whatever Taliban uh, would rule on them. But now many Afghan girls aren't waiting for the Taliban government to change their minds. But now women are finding ways to create opportunities for themselves. Um, I'm involved uh, and I know there are many secret schools currently going on that the women, uh, that they're finding locals around the Taliban ban on girls uh, attending secondary education by operating girls, a madrasa, or religious schools. They're providing like the online, there's an online movement currently going on. Like, of course, the schools are banned, but the, they're trying in the areas where their education is that there are small uh, projects that they provide access to internet or other facilities so if there is a one a person educated in that community so they teach through that online movement so there's no stoppage in the because they have already lost one year of education 
till now. So that's why the, this is the one way that they are getting because people are so desperate about education. And when I see the fact that people have found all of these different ways to try to work around the Taliban ban is an indication how desperately people want education for themselves, for their daughters and for their girls in the family. Um, one of my relatives, uh, she, she is in eighth grade of school that now currently she is not allowed to go to school. Uh, I talk with their parents and they tell me that at the same time, every day she wakes up, uh, she prepares her tiffin. Uh, she gets dressed up on her old school plots that she has from her last year. And, and she, uh, then she opened her books from the school and her parents, of course, got her some books for the eighth grade. And she is self-studying with herself. Uh, and then she has a lunch break and then till the time when the school ends. And their parents tell her why you can do it without being dressed up, without cleaning your shoes and preparing. She says, mom, I, f I want to have the feeling that I'm going to school. Uh, I want to feel that because education, that's a dream and hope, especially in America, you cannot feel that because people take education for granted. It's a, but that's not the fact in Afghanistan. It's how much people are just, they are deprived from their very ba basic right, which is education. So there are many hundreds of stories like that but it touched my heart like to see like how this young girl she dress up and just because she is not allowed to go to school but she want to have the feeling that okay it's time for school and I'm going so, um, so but this is the good part about this that that, that may, gives me hope because people are not stopping people are trying ways uh, finding ways to come out of this and I'm sure I'm very hopeful that with the help of people like you all and like organization like CAI and other and thanks to the generous donors that they are still committed to help people in Afghanistan because um, most of the time I heard uh, the, uh, that a lot of people that they were donating at first but nowadays they say okay people their uh, girls are not allowed to go to uh, high school education so there's no uh, it doesn't make sense to give more funding but no that's not right please don't stop that because the we need that afghanistan needs that woman needs that and we have to fight for it if everyone stops so that we are letting taliban to win but we don't want that we want to change that but yeah i'm so glad that um uh, right now i'm here at least uh and i don't want that experience for, of course for my daughters i have two daughters they're small and whenever i uh, stories like that makes me sad um I'm happy that I'm here. Of course, I'm sad that they will not know my country uh, because they are growing far from that. But at least I'm happy uh, that they will not experience the life that other women are experiencing currently in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Well, Dunya, that's very touching. And um, it's this story, you know, stories like that that definitely um, really bring it home um, what, what people are experiencing. and. Um, you know, it's hard for us to imagine, as you say here, what, what girls are going through and how they had their hopes so dashed. All right, I'm going to ask, uh, Hasina, I'm going to ask you one more question and then I want to turn it over to the audience. So um, maybe you can tell us, um, I mean, you can add whatever you'd like before we go to the audience, but I, I did, did want to, was wondering if there are personal stories that you have about um, some of the children that you're supporting through AAE um, and, and what education is like for them these days? Yes, of course, we um, have received many, many uh, very, in a way, heartbreaking and inspiring stories. We have been helping a lot of um, disabled um, girls, young girls who are 10, 12 years old, and they never really had the opportunity to go to school. Unfortunately, disabled children and generally disabled people are not really treated very well by, by the communities in Afghanistan. They treat them like they're outlaws. So they, they, they're not really, they don't feel like they can do anything for the, themselves. So I would be very happy to actually read the words of 
uh, one of these students, um, Najla, who is, um, and you can see her, um, who is 12 years old. And, um, and she says that um, um, uh, it, this is the first time that she has had the opportunity to be in a classroom. And, uh, and she says that the school was too far, the, the public school um, for me and I couldn't walk. It was because she's, she cannot walk. She, her, there's something wrong with her legs. It was uh, just a dream that I would be learning and getting an education one day. And she says that grew up feeling that I was a disabled girl and constantly mistreated and uh, felt a sense that I was a burden to my family and community. Um, I always believe that only education can make a change and help me um, uh, achieve my dreams. Um, and she says that I, I have already lost my physical strength and I had never imagined that my school dream would come true in one, one day and I will um, start learning in a center near my house. Uh, and she says that I, I dream of becoming a doctor and treat those uh, who are struggling with this problem of, uh, that cannot walk. Um, and she also says that I request continuous support for my education. Um, so, and there are many others. We have some, we received some, some pictures that was really very sad. I mean, girls with their faces, I don't know, something, uh, not deformed, but something on their skin that they cannot really go out and show themselves to people and all kinds of things. And they also say the same thing. They also say that we want to become a doctor to help others who have the same problem. So yes, it's, it's very crucial that we help these people. All right, well, th thank you both so much for those, those comments. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Sonia because I think she is managing the Q&A box um, and, and let's start on some questions. Yeah, thank you um, all who have submitted questions so far and, and anyone feel free to enter a, a question in the chat box and we'll, we'll get through all these. Um, so the first question, um, this is probably a, a good one for Hasina and anyone else feel free to, to add on when she's finished, but um, are any Afghan women, uh, thank you for your question, Kathy, and Kathy's wondering, are any Afghan women able to attend college currently? Yes, universities are open. Uh, but they're limited as far as how to dress and how to go to universities. They, they are separated. Um, the girls and boys are, shouldn't be together in classrooms anymore in the universities. Uh, and they have to be totally covered. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, this is, I, I don't know who to direct this question to. This is a tough one, so. <laughs> whoever can can volunteer to tackle this one. But um, Walter, thank you for your question. Um, Walter's question is, given the high percentage of Afghan people who want education for their family, what justification does the Taliban give for its failure to open um, schools for high school girls? And uh, what is the Taliban's position on girls' education above sixth grade? I feel like we could spend an hour on, on just this question alone. <laughs> Um, well, I, I can say that, you know, they're not really giving any justification. There's really no justification when they decide to do something, they just do it. It's not that they will say, you know, this is really the reason why we're not doing it. Um, so I think keeping the population uh, uneducated uh, is to their benefit, basically. 
And uh, yes, I would uh, like to add that, of course, there are no justification from Taliban. They have done a lot of brutal things um, in the past. Uh, so they have uh, no justification for any of their action. But people are, as uh, um, Ms. Sherjan said, one of the, the justification is, of course, they don't want women to be educated. Otherwise, they will not rule the way they are ruling right now. Uh, they, uh, the other justification is that they, they are not pro to education. They don't want uh, education and they are using, uh, say the system is not good. We, want, want to we don't want to have co-education, but already the school at the uh, primary and second level, they were not, they were not co-education. So, but they have opened some of the university, of course, like the private universities, uh, girls are going to uh, university because they are paying for it. So uh, the economic is another reason. And of course they want um, international recognition from UN and other states, which is, that's why uh, the US or other state are not recognizing their government. So I think they are using this as a tool as well uh, to put more pressure on UN, on US that uh, recognize our government. Uh, so then UN can instead say, okay, then open the girls' schools. So I think that's how politics, of course, there are a lot of things to do with politics in this. Uh, but um, but that was also the case back in 20 years, it was banned. So they're not uh, giving women rights, even if the recognition is uh, given to them. Yeah, I would just add to, to that is that before, you know, before they took full control, they had already started their, their secret war on women, um, which was the systematic execution, <laughs> and, you know, just some, you know, just I guess you would call them assassinations of, of women, human rights leaders, women, women's leader, uh, women's rights leaders, and and female judges um, were being murdered um, by the Taliban. So it really spoke to me when I was reading about this and realizing how terrified they are of educated women. That to them it it will um, you know it undermines their whole philosophy. Um, and it makes me laugh in a way because, you know, women are not bearing, you know, largely not the ones who are bearing arms, and yet they are the, probably the most terrifying thing to the Taliban. Um, and then also something um, Hasina had said earlier about, it's the same with, with men, though. I mean, in the former regime that, you know, uneducated men were where they got their ranks and files are, are ignorant people, right? So um, uh, it's, it's education in general um, is something that is a, is a threat to their power. Thank you. Yeah, I, I thought that would be one that uh, several people would need to weigh in on. So um, the next question from Eileen, thanks so much for your question, Eileen. What grades are included in community-based education and then what happens afterwards? after they're um, done with their community-based education class. Asina, do you wanna take that one? Yes, uh, education, uh, community-based education is from grade one to six. And right now we're uh, operating one to three. And um, so after that, uh, we will have to decide. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, um, I'm really hoping that we will continue um, after sixth grade also in this way, because uh, it's not guaranteed that the Taliban will allow girls to go to school after sixth grade. And also uh, there are no close by uh, schools, so it's gonna be still very difficult for the girls to walk anywhere. Um, and um, I'm hoping that we will continue with an accelerated education program, which we have done the last 20 years, and, and we know how effective and powerful it is for students to study one grade in, in two years, and then up to sixth grade, and then after that, uh, they study uh, 12 months within eight point 
7.8.5 year, uh, 8.5 months, because we didn't have um, four months of winter holidays and we warmed up and heated the classrooms. And so they studied all the time and they didn't want to have four months of winter holidays. In fact, we gave them a month off one winter in 2006 when it snowed a lot in Kabul. And fathers came back knocking on the door and saying, when are you opening up? You know, my girls don't want to sit at home anymore. So I'm really hoping and wanting to continue after sixth grade with this accelerated education to help them to have a high school uh, education. And I'll just say to add to that one of the things about as well is that we are piloting, you know, so, and, and, and Dunya referred to this as she's been talking to her own relatives back home. We are piloting these at home learning programs for, for girls who are above sixth grade now and, um, and hoping that, well, ho well, we're hoping obviously that the Taliban will change its policy, but if that doesn't happen, we want to continue to help them to learn. And, and some of these ideas are using online learning platforms as well as just physically bringing books and, and things to the girls' homes, having them learn, having them use the eighth, ninth, 10th grade lesson plans. Um, so, so this is an area where we're, we're focusing now for the coming years on how to do that in case the Taliban does not reverse this policy. Um, exactly, and uh, uh, thank you for reminding me that we are actually right now working on developing uh, online learning and, uh, and uh, so also a portal even on our website that they can log in and possibly distribution of um, tablets with education uh, material inside and they can plug in and, and update it and, and things like this right now. So um, it, it may take uh, a few months to complete it, but I, I think online learning will be um, will be a great success in Afghanistan in many ways. Thank you. Um, next question, this is probably um, a great one for Alice and, and then Dr. Khan, feel free to, to add anything on it um, at the end. Um, Keith is wondering how active is CAI, CAI outside of Afghanistan? Um, for instance, how many schools um, and, and what countries do we work in outside of Afghanistan? So Alice, do you want to, oh, you're on. Sure, um, thank you, Keith, for your question. Uh, so we have programs in Pakistan and Tajikistan as well. Um, the second largest, I mean, pa the Pakistan program is equally as large as the Afghanistan program. We just happen to be talking about Afghanistan today. Um, but there we support um, both, both formal schools and non-formal schools. Um, I would say we support probably over a hundred schools in Pakistan today, and we do a lot of training for teachers. Um, we do some other um, more innovative programs with mobile libraries and radio programs and all kinds of programs that are aimed at increasing education uh, for children in, in Pakistan. Primarily, again, all of whom are in very remote mountainous areas where it's very hard to even access a school if there is one nearby. Uh, we also have uh, a program in Tajikistan, although it is smaller. Um, there we um, support, um, we, we build schools there still, which is something we don't really do very much in, in, in Afghanistan and Pakistan anymore, but we build schools. We also do a lot with women um, and livelihoods and teaching them on business entrepreneurship. So we have an array of programs there. Um, so there's more information. Um, you can contact us directly for more specifics and there's information on the website, on the country pages, and then also just shoot us an email, Keith, if you have more specific questions. Great, uh, let's see, Sharon. Um, yeah, this is a great question, and, and I don't know, um, probably any, anyone could weigh in on this, uh, Dunya or, or Hasina or Alice. Sure. Um, if girls cannot continue education after sixth grade, will the Taliban encourage them to marry? Um, so, uh, yes, we have seen some cases that I'm in contact with the remote areas from my village, like 
it was hard before for the parents to let their daughters to get education, but there had been a lot of investment for the past 20 years to like ban children marriages. Uh, so providing like there were a lot of organizations such as Asia Foundation and many more that they were providing trainings to stop child uh, marriages. And there uh, a law was created to and passed by the parliament uh, that the, the children manage is not allowed uh, according to the law. But, uh, and there was of course, uh, just education was one of the big justification for those girls that uh, their parents were encouraged. Okay, at least I will let my daughter to study till uh, 12th grade. So by that time, they will uh, have, meet the age of marriage which is 16 for girl and 18 for boys under the Afghanistan constitution. But now uh, when the girls are not allowed to go to school, so by sitting uh, at home, even the parent, it's hard for them to uh, like, of course, econ there's a economic inflation in Afghanistan. So the, there will be a lot of, we can, we will be seeing a lot of increase in uh, childhood marriages uh, for, especially for girls. Um, the, and that is one of the uh, disappointing point about this. So uh, I, I'm aware of few cases, but I hope it doesn't happen. And I hope um, the international community put pressure on Tanabal to open the schools back for uh, girls. Otherwise, we will see a lot of increase in childhood marriages again. And also, I, I, this is one of one of the reasons that it's crucial to pay attention to boys' education. Is that at one point we I was really worried that we had you know we graduated two thousand five hundred students and we still had almost four thousand students in the classes that uh, these are well educated and they received scholarships and they went to universities and how will they find a educated husbands? Because at the end of the day, you know, if they're married to an illiterate man, the, he doesn't know the value of education and he will force her to stay home and then it's a waste of time. So um, it's not so, uh, and, and the parents of course want their daughters to be married. They don't want an extra uh, mouth to feed. So um, our experience has been that when our students became educated, they graduated from universities and they got jobs and they were making money like, you know, this one girl who graduated, her father was working at um, a bakery, an Afghan bakery making $80 a month, feeding 10 children. Um, she, her daughter, the daughter who graduated from our program, we helped her to go to American University of Afghanistan. In fact, we didn't have money to support her for the last year and the president of the university paid for her to finish. And she got a job with DAI and her first uh, salary was $900 a month. And when I, I talked to her and she said, the first thing I did was I told my father that you don't have to work anymore. So um, it's really, really important because then they become breadwinners of the families, and then the family is not interested in her getting married. Yeah, that's such a great point. Um, great, thank you. Um, next question, and, and again, this I think this is a great question um, for both Dunya and, and Hasina, so um, if you could both weigh in. Do you think the Taliban will try to stop online learning? I don't know if they have the interest to stop internet access. And also um, they, they use the internet themselves. So I, I definitely hope that because if they stop the internet access, then there will be no country. So all everything, you know, even the banking system that is not working right now properly, but they need internet. So, and <coughs> uh, salaries of uh, organizations, the, and, uh, internally we pay um, uh, through internet. It just, everything is now, you know, this last 20 years, everything's changed. So I really don't think that um, they will be interested in stopping internet. They may restrict it, but then we'll find another way. 
Great. Um, so we have a, about four minutes left and a couple questions. So we'll we'll um, go through these. Um, this is uh, an anonymous attendee, so I, I can't thank you for submitting your question, but um, thank you for wanting to get involved. This person is wondering, what are the best ways to get involved with Central Asia Institute um, outside of financially? For example, this person works in big tech um, and is wondering if they're a volunteer or engagement opportunities where they can apply their technical or business skills on a volunteer basis. It's probably a good one for Alice to tackle. Yeah, no, um, well, get in touch with us. Uh, we'll talk to you individually, um, depending on what it's what you're interested in. It is tough, obviously, to get volunteers to work overseas for us um, because of the barriers of language and travel and everything else. But there's other ways to get, certainly many other ways to get involved with Central Asia Institute, one of which is just being on this call and sharing what you're hearing with friends and making people aware of what's happening right now overseas and just not letting this fade off of the radar. Um, so reach out um, to the info account or to Sonia or to me. Um, um, I see, Sonia, we have like two more questions that are sort of related. Maybe you could wind them into one and then we could we could uh, could to, could leave a mo moment for some closing remarks. Yeah, yeah, because I think um, this, this is such a great point, um, speaking to the um, the number of people in Afghanistan that don't have access to Internet. Um, so the person, kind of the two questions combined, um, is there a way we're offering online courses um, to students that don't have access to internet? And I think, Alice, you could probably tackle that with some of the remote um, tablet programs that, that we're working on. Yeah, so thanks. Thanks, Julie, and thanks, Carol. Um, so yes, as Julie points out, um, only 13.5% of Afghan families have access to, to the internet. Um, so that's a problem, particularly in the places where we work, because we work in largely rural areas. Uh, the, the, the way some of this is addressed is that um, we use pretty much what our partners use, which basically a, a flash drive and um, the teacher will be in a, a hub area like a town where they will download the lesson plan onto the USB stick. So you, you then can give this to the students, you distribute it along with the learning materials, and then the students or the teachers themselves sometimes download this content right onto the device. So you, you, you share a device, you share a USB stick, and you, you, you do online lessons that way. Um, and that's something we've done both in Pakistan and, and are, are doing in Afghanistan. Um, and, um, it, it, but largely a lot of the at-home learning is just through the normal lesson plan distribution and having the teachers go from house to house and giving the written materials and the lesson plans and the reading and then collecting homework and keeping students up to, up to speed that way. So again, we, we rely on the communities themselves to make this happen. Great. Um, so I want to <clears throat> I want to just give we have a few minutes like one minute left. So um, is there anything Dunya or um, Hasina that you'd like to say before we get off, and then I'll make some closing remarks. Um, no, not really. Um, thank you very much, and it's been a great pleasure being here with everybody. Okay. Um, for me as well, I have just one message. Uh, I want uh, everyone to support Afghanistan uh, and special education of girls as much, as much as they can. So that's my message for everyone. Thank you so much. Well, we, we cannot thank you two enough. I mean, um, it's just, I just feel very lucky that we have the opportunity to, to present two voices, authentic voices of women who are living this who um, have had to live through this. <clears throat> I know, I don't know, um, but I felt some of the um, complete dismay that you have felt in the past year with what's happened, um, a country where you both, uh, your home country, where you've put so much time, energy, love, and have people you love. And I just, we really feel for you. And it's just, thank you for sharing this message with us and then doing what you do for Afghanistan and letting us, um, be a vehicle for presenting that work to the broader American public and CAI supporters. So, so thank you very much. Uh, before I 
jump off, I, I want to thank everybody, all of you for joining us today again. It, it really is, uh, we really appreciate the interest. Um, so again, next month, um, you're going to be reading more about it. It's one year. Unbelievably, it's one year. I mean, um, that day is stuck in our minds here. Um, I'm sure in the minds forever of Dunya and Hasina, but um, it's been one year already. And um, we at CAI are um, more committed than ever to staying in Afghanistan. And although the challenges are enormous, we are working in every way we can to bring education at all levels to the extent we're able, we're adapting, we're adjusting, and, and thanks to our partners, we can do this. Uh, we are gonna be um, launching a campaign next month. So keep your uh, eyes open in your inboxes. We wanna expand education next year. We're trying to raise money to educate even more Afghan children, boys and girls, but primarily girls. And we wanna expand the number of community-based schools we're supporting to 250 schools, which would enroll 7,500 children. So again, keep your eyes open. Um, and we are so grateful to all of you for tuning in and for your past support for CAI and making all of this possible. Um, so with that, thank you, uh, Dr. Khan. It was great to have you on. Thank you, Asina. Thank you, Dunya. And thank you, Sonia. And thank all of you. Thank you very much. All right. Have a great afternoon. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye.